Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Here's a list of words that should not go together, but do. Alone together. How many times have you heard that during the coronavirus pandemic? Deafening silence. I know what that means, but when you think about it, the juxtaposition is strange. Definitely, maybe. Good name for a Britpop album, but an odd combination of words. Random order. Walking dead. Original copy. Here's another one. Pop punk. You know what I mean by that. But those words should not go together. Punk was originally created as an attack on pop. I mean, how did we get from this? To this. When you look at things like that, it is weird that those two songs are related. But do a DNA test. It will come back positive. Over the decades, pop and punk merged to create a hybrid that's responsible for selling hundreds of millions of records and concert tickets. How did this happen? That's what we're looking at. This is part two of a history of pop punk. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Green Day from the fall of 1995 with Walking Contradiction, a single from the Insomniac album. Now, if we dig into that record, it's a little heavier than Dookie, which is the previous record. The lyrics are more on the doom and gloom side. It might be a little more sarcastic than anything that they had done to date, but it's an easy record to digest because of the song structures and the melodies. It is definitely punk, but at the same time, it incorporates pop songwriting sensibilities. There is no way to describe Green Day and what they do other than they're a form of pop punk. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the second half of an exploration into this idea of punk and pop coming together to form an insanely successful form of alt-rock. On the last program, we dug into how the loud, fast, angry, and nihilistic punk of the 1970s and early 1980s morphed into the pop punk that is so big today. We looked at how melody and harmonies and all the other hallmarks of pop music turned punk into something a little bit different, and in many ways more palatable for those for whom pure punk was a little too intense. We left off when Green Day released a couple of records on an East Bay indie label called Lookout Records, and it's around here where the pop punk story really begins to take off. We'll pick things up in 1992. Now, this, of course, was the era of grunge. We had Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and so on. Then came the Smashing Pumpkins and Stone Temple Pilots and any number of bands that played slow and low and sometimes with that quiet, loud dynamic. The sudden popularity of this branch of alt-rock caught everybody by surprise. Up until the early 90s, this was music for weirdos and outsiders. But in 1991, there was a fundamental shift in the way weekly album charts were compiled. This is important. Up until February 28th, 1991, album sales were merely estimates. Billboard magazine, the keeper of the charts, would phone around to a select group of record stores and get verbal reports of what albums were selling. They then take this data, extrapolate it to the rest of the country, and publish the results in their top 200 album chart. Now, obviously, this was not very accurate. Because Billboard had to rely on the word of people at these record stores, the data was obviously open to mistakes, lies, bribery, and all manner of manipulation. But then, on March 1st, 1991, a new system came online. It was called SoundScan. And instead of relying on these verbal sales reports, album sales were counted as the barcode was scanned at the checkout. And the result was a much, much, much more accurate picture of who was selling what. When the first report arrived, it was obvious that certain genres and certain artists were being overcounted, while others were being greatly underestimated. 
to everyone's surprise, country music was selling way better than anyone knew. And so was left-of-center rock music that had been mostly ignored up until that point. That point really hit home in the fall of that year when Nirvana's Nevermind album was certified as selling 300,000 copies a week, every week, for months. So this caused the record labels to pivot. If that's what was selling, well, then let's go find more of it. And so began the grunge gold rush. Once that gold rush got underway, it didn't take long for the labels to realize that there was an appetite for alt-rock beyond grunge. So they started looking for related music. Beneficiaries included Jane's Addiction, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Sonic Youth, and R.E.M. At first, pure punk was considered to be a little too strident, a little too intense for mass consumption. But time passed, and alt-rock grew even more popular. What about these punk bands with the sing-along melodies? Yeah, they had that rebellious attitude and big guitars and fast beats, but they were also very tuneful. Now let's, let's sign them up and see what happens. Green Day was one of the first to be scooped up. They signed a deal with Reprise Records, the label created by, of all people, Frank Sinatra in 1960, who was the biggest star of the 20th century to that point, and they issued a record called Dookie on February 1st, 1994. Things started slow for the record, selling just 9,000 copies in its first week, which was insanely low for that time. But then an odd thing happened. Two months after Dookie was released, Kurt Cobain was found dead. And suddenly the heaviness and bleakness of grunge seemed a little too much. And besides, there was a feeling that grunge was slowly losing momentum. Nirvana's In Utero album had been a sales disappointment compared to Nevermind. Pearl Jam had distanced itself from their grunge roots. Soundgarden was evolving into something different. And the bands left behind sounded more and more derivative with each passing month. So, time for something new. And waiting in the wings was Green Day. By the summer of 1994, that Dookie album peaked at number two on the Billboard charts and was a number one hit in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Plus, it hit the top ten in a half dozen other countries. And at last count, this one pop punk record has sold at least. 20 million units. There were two ways to look at punk rock in the middle 1990s. There was the punk rock revival, which we've talked about on this show before, and the idea of pop and punk coming together like, uh, well, chocolate and peanut butter. In fact, you can argue that this form of alt-rock was even more accessible to more people than grunge. And the timing was right for another reason, too. After a brutal recession earlier in the decade, the world economy began to improve, and people's moods began to improve. While they weren't prepared to leave all their angst behind, they did want to lighten up a little bit. And the pop-punk sound proved to be just what they needed. As Green Day got bigger through the summer of 1994, other groups were swept along with them. For example, Bad Religion. They had been working on their own independent epitaph records, and they were convinced to sign a major record deal. And on September 6th, 1994, they released an album entitled Stranger Than Fiction, and it quickly sold more than half a million copies. Bad Religion with 21st Century Digital Boy. Again, punk rock, but with pop songwriting sensibilities. Another pure punk band that was deemed melodic enough for primetime was Rancid. They evolved out of a Bay Area band called Operation Ivy, and in 1993, were recording for Bad Religion's Epitaph Records. And around the time Bad Religion was being courted, Rancid's name came up. Did they have anything that might be of interest? Well, yes. Yes, they did. Rancid and Salvation from their Let's Go album, which was released in June of 1994. Okay, the record man said, Epitaph has given us Bad Religion and Rancid. Both have done well. You wouldn't happen to have anything else we might want to hear, do you? Well, as a matter of fact, there was another band. There's another group from Orange County that has given us two albums already, but neither did very well. Still, you might want to give them a shot. 
the release date of the third album kind of got lost because it was released on April 8th, 1994. And, and you know what happened on that day. That's the day that we found out that Kurt Cobain had killed himself. So, uh, yeah. But, but, but you might want to give it a listen. The record was Smash by The Offspring. And to date, it sold over 18 million copies, making it the biggest selling indie record of all time. Well, at least to that point. The offspring from the Smash album of 1994, contributing to that big 12-month period where pop punk broke through to the mainstream. Now, in retrospect, this sound could not lose. It was high energy. It was fun. It had just enough anger and rebelliousness. And demographics were in its favor. Generation X was at its peak. There were a lot of kids in that cohort, and they loved this music. MTV and Much Music played all the videos. And even more radio stations adopted the alternative rock format. Some flipped when grunge came along. Even more joined the party in the mid-90s with the punk rock revival, which, as we've proven, was largely powered by bands that we'd soon assign to the genre of pop punk. In many ways, this was rock's last years at the top of the cultural heat before hip-hop and rap really started to exert its power and influence. But back then, pop punk still had room to grow and evolve. And we'll look at some of that music in just a second. This is part two of a look at the history of pop punk, that interesting collision of songwriting and performance attitudes that's become so pervasive and popular within the world of alternative music. We're into the mid-90s now, and the punk rock revival is underway. A big part of why this revival was so big and so powerful was because the music was much more accessible to more people than old school punk, and certainly a lot easier to digest than the hardcore that had emerged in the early 1980s. This did cause some consternation. As this new punk became more popular and more visible and more commercially successful, the purists became annoyed, accusing groups like Green Day and The Offspring and Rancid of selling out. And Bad Religion, with a major record label, leaving their own indie imprint, Epitaph, behind? It's blasphemy. It's sacrilege. And you could kind of see their point. The music was not the right word, but I'll say it, softer in intensity than a lot of older punk rock, which in the eyes of some disqualified it from even using the word punk to describe what they were doing. At best, these were illegitimate pretenders to the punk tradition. Now, no one wants their treasured music to be the same thing that everyone else is into. And yeah, it was a little disconcerting to see these bands, this music and this subculture show up in the mall and in mainstream culture. It was all over commercial radio and all over the video channels. The purists said that pop punk was now part of the establishment. It was the establishment that punk rock was supposed to kick against. Well, maybe, but that wasn't going to stop this flavor of punk from growing and growing. A lot of credit has to go to the Warp Tour, which began in 1995. And then in 1996, it took on a corporate sponsor, Vance, the maker of skate shoes. Okay, so it was a cool brand that the kids loved, but you can see how the punk purists bristled at this. The Warp Tour, no wait, sorry, it's the Vans Warp Tour, got into the pop punk thing right from the beginning because that's what the kids were clamoring for. That and ska punk, which can be viewed as a subset of pop punk. The Warp Tour ran for 24 summers, each featuring dozens and dozens and dozens of acts. In just the first few years, the tour featured Bad Religion, Dancehall Crashers, Face to Face, Buck of Nine, Less Than Jake, Muddy Muddy Boss Tones, No Doubt, Sublime, and Goldfinger. Goldfinger, a group had a really good run in the middle and late 90s. Lots of radio play for songs like that, and lots of exposure thanks to video channels and MTV. If there's one characteristic of pop punk that set it apart from traditional punk was its attitude. Gone were the politics and social messages and class struggles. The music was fun, almost carefree at times. A big chunk of it was written in major keys, meaning that the music inherently sounded happy. And it was okay to be goofy and juvenile. In fact, that was encouraged. Why? Well, the economy was good. There was a Democrat in the White House, which almost always results in happier-sounding music overall. 
And this music was such an antidote, such a release from the gloom of grunge in the early 90s recession that helped birth it. In other words, things were okay, and the music reflected it. The Offspring turned out to be especially good at figuring this out. In November 1998, The Offspring released their Americana album, and the big single featured the story of a hapless white kid who just couldn't figure out how to be cool. Offspring's Americana album was full of pop-punk fun like this, along with songs like Why Don't You Get a Job and a cover of the Super Sappy Feelings, a 1975 ballad by a dude named Morris Albert, done for ironic effect, of course. If you have the CD and fast forward to the end, you'll even find a hidden track. Yeah, goofy. Another big record for The Offspring, too. It's all over 10 million copies. And I should mention that by this time, The Offspring had jumped from Epitaph, the indie label that brought them up, to Columbia, an imprint of Sony, one of the major labels. Again, the music had a punk edge, but the attitude was, for the most part, about having fun. And like I said, this was one of the defining abilities of pop punk. And nowhere was this attitude more on display than with Blink-182. They came out of San Diego and had a mainstream breakthrough with their Dude Ranch album, a record that they put on display when they went on the road with the Warp Tour. But then in 1999, they released their Enema of the State album. This represented the high water mark for pop punk. It starts with a picture of a porn star, Janine Lindemulder, on the cover, posing as a naughty nurse. And the songs were about everything from being frustrated and not being able to find a girlfriend to fun Ramon-style pop to wondering about the existence of aliens to teen suicide. Okay, that last one was a bit serious, but Adam's song, which is the track I'm talking about, was presented in a sympathetic way that kids could identify with. But goofiness and fun ruled the album and any tour that followed. Bass player Mark Hoppus realized that he was in his 20s, but he was still acting like a dumb teenager. He felt bad about that. Not too bad. Blink-182 with What's My Age Again from the Enema of the State album, which has sold north of 15 million copies worldwide. Naturally, the bigger Blink-182 got, the more the recorded music industry tried to tap into this attitude, this vein of gold. And it continued to work. More in a moment. As we moved into the 21st century, pop punk just kept spreading. Blink-182 was way out in front, especially after the 2001 album Take Off Your Pants and Jacket, which, by the way, sold another 50 million copies. But all these bands were having a good time. AFI, Alien Ant Farm, All American Rejects, The Ataris, Billy Talent, Good Charlotte, Headley, Jimmy Eat World, Lit, MXPX, Nerf Herder, Plain White Tees, Presidents of the United States of America, Red Jumpsuit Apparatus, Smash Mouth, Treble Charger, Weedus, the list just goes on and on and on. A group worth mentioning is Sum 41. They broke out of Canada with a multi platinum album and a song called Fat Lip. This is from the All Killer No Filler album. And from then on, Sum 41 became a pop punk staple everywhere. By the time we get to the middle of the first decade of the 21st century, we started to see a bifurcation in the pop-punk world. For some, you could be too poppy for punk. For example, groups like Headley and Simple Plan and Good Charlotte were maybe a little too light. This meant that some alt-rock radio stations refused to play them, saying that they appealed to the wrong kind of people. That is, their fans were too young and not sufficiently infused with the true spirit of punk and alternative music. Too top 40 was a criticism that they got. A good example of this would be Avril Lavigne. She had the nickname of Pop Punk Queen for a while, but was considered to be too pop to be alternative. Same thing with Fifi Dobson, Sky Sweetenham, and even Paramore. I can tell you from experience that audiences were not very receptive to this branch of the pop punk tree. If we tried to play Simple Plan, for example, the complaints would start immediately. Same thing if we slotted in some Headley. 
And it didn't matter what the song sounded like. If it was Headley, well, then it had to be bad. Good Charlotte started out as being fine, but were eventually shouted down by the audience. I'd hear things like, why are you playing that kitty punk? Now, to be honest, the contrast with some of these groups was made all the more obvious when Green Day roared back with an ultra-political concept album, Rock Opera, that nonetheless still kept their pop-punk sensibilities intact. They just kind of redefined things. Pop punk roared through the first five or seven years of the century, picking up steam when emo went mainstream. Groups like My Chemical Romance added a new twist to things. But as the decade came to an end, only the superstar acts like Green Day and Blink-182 continued to draw huge crowds. The video channels no longer showed videos for anyone. Magazines like Alternative Press and Spin, which were big supporters of the sound, shrunk to online publications. Commercial radio started to move into other areas of music. And a lot of bands saw where the wind was blowing when it came to trends in popular music. Pure pop ruled in the late aughts. So these groups decided to err on the side of pop when it came to writing new tunes. This was the direction taken by Fall Out Boy and Panic at the Disco. That's a tough shift to make without losing some of your fan base. Meanwhile, the pop punk audience that had been with this music scene since the middle 90s had grown up and moved on. Circle of life, you know? Now, though, people talk about new punk pop, new spelled with a U and an umlaut. Starting sometime after 2010, we began to see a new generation of pop punk bands. And overall, it seems a little darker than what we saw in the 1990s. Maybe that's the result of the 2008 financial crisis or the election of Donald Trump. Meanwhile, overall, alt-rock moved down tempo and away from being guitar heavy. More keyboards, more samples, more banjos. In fact, it went through a pop phase more profound than we'd seen since maybe the 1980s. In a strange twist, pop punk sounded heavy in comparison to the acts that were doing well, and this went on for a couple of years in the 2010s. Now, that's since changed. Blink-182 and Green Day are still with us, of course. So is The Offspring and Billy Talent and Fall Out Boy. But there are some new names to add to the list. For example, Five Seconds of Summer, All Time Low, The Wonder Years. And let's hear something from a band called Neck Deep. They are from Wales. They have a number of albums. They had a record that made it into the top 10 on the UK charts and into the top 20 on Billboard. And then in 2017, an album called The Peace and the Panic reached the top four on both sides of the Atlantic. Here's a single called Where Do We Go When We Go. I guess it doesn't get much more pop punk than that, does it? Pop punk has proved to be pretty enduring. It has had its ups and downs and probably won't ever be as big as it was during the middle 90s. Other genres like rap and hip hop have siphoned away potential audiences, but I can't see it ever going away, which is good because you got to have that measure of snottiness in music, right? This program is available as a podcast. You can download as many episodes as you like from Apple Podcasts or you can listen through Spotify and every other podcast platform in the known universe. If you want playlists for any show, just go to my website, search Ongoing History, and you'll find what you need. The website is a ajournalofmusicalthings.com. Once you're there, stay for all the music news and information that appears daily, and sign up for the daily newsletter, too. It's free. We can also connect through Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and feel free to send any email to alan at alancross.ca. Technical production is by Rob Johnston. We'll see you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.